Hello everybody and welcome back to Aviax Education. Tonight we're going to talk about Auto the Autopilot. Welcome aviation enthusiasts and dreamers. If we haven't met before, my name is Bruce Bissett. I am an expert in all things airplanes. I'm a 40 year survivor in the aviation industry. I teach avionics, maintenance, aircraft ownership and FAA regulations. I teach both online and in classrooms. My students come from high school, colleges, repair stations, and the FA Academy. So let's start a conversation and shed some light on this wild world of aviation. Hello everybody, welcome back <clears throat> to Auto the Autopilot. Um, kind of a joke with me, if you ever remember the movie Airplane, I love this scene where he would punch the autopilot and this blow up to all come up. Well tonight, we're going to get into not so much the joke of the movie, but actually a little bit of the basics of autopilots. Uh, I know I want to stay within my zone here and deal with um, autopilots, general aviation. Uh, we I will do air carrier later on. But in this one, I'm going to go through and just talk about the basics of what an autopilot is, uh, how to do some simple checks, look out for some uh, troubleshooting tech problems and techniques with autopilots, and then just open it up for questions. Now, this is not a live feed, I understand. And the reason for that is I ran out of time uh, today and I had to go through and do the video first so terribly sorry about that but we're going to go ahead and move forward with the video and get this produced and get everything put out. So what I want to do is make sure also that I'm getting really close to 3,000 subscribers. Now in the world of YouTube that's really absolutely nothing but in my world in the world of views that are looking at my videos and learning avionics and some FA certification regulations, that sort of things. I appreciate every one of you that comes in. But don't forget to subscribe if you're not subscribed already. Share and like the video. Um, I'm not monetized and they won't let me be monetized, but at least I can go through and spread the word and do some more videos. So tonight we're going to talk about understanding your autopilot. Now, every avionics technician has one system they're very good at. And for me, it was the autopilot system. Now, going back to 1989, I've been testing, installing, and troubleshooting aircraft autopilot systems. Uh, when I was at America West Airlines, 757s, 747s, Airbuses, it was all very fascinating uh, modern technology. Remember, glass cockpit at the time was just coming in. And you always learn to enjoy the things that you are interested in. And I found the autopilot system challenging because so many people couldn't understand how it worked. And it was complicated enough to keep me interested. And the other thing I found fascinating about the autopilot system is that it takes information from other many or so many other sources of data in the aircraft put it all together and then produced an outcome. The aircraft would actually be flying itself. Now, early in my days of flight training, an autopilot for me personally in a GA airplane was a distant dream, you know, only to be seen on the expensive jets I worked on that night. Uh, and we'll get to that in a second, but I wanna talk about the purposes of autopilots. Well, it's interesting when you think about what an autopilot is, an autopilot is a self-autonomous um, device that's designed to pilot. And back in the day, it was uh, some of the earlier autopilots when pilots was referred to a nautical term. When we got into aviation, I mean, we're talking the infancy of aviation. If the airplane was, was technically invented in 2003 with the Wright brothers, we were looking at putting autopilots on aircraft right after that. Uh, and we'll talk, show that here in a second. But later on, autopilots became a mandatory safety requirement. So like shown here, you've got a 727 here where you have a two channel autopilot. Now I've got three people in the cockpit of this airplane, but even with three people with the complicated civil systems as fast as the aircraft was at the time, an autopilot was a very important part of operating an aircraft. Another issue of autopilots, especially if aircraft got faster, that flew higher, we talked about aircraft that were being operated in what we say coffin corner. And coffin corner was that part of the flight envelope where the stall speed and the never exceed speed were really getting close to each other. 
because of pressure density altitude. And when I was getting my 3.7 type rating, we would take up the airplane to 40,000 feet and we would fly what's called hands off to shut off the autopilot, raw data, shut off the flight director. And for me as a human being to keep the airplane level as a pilot, it was like trying to balance on the head of a pin where a half a degree up, a degree up represented 500 feet per minute climb or de uh, descent. And to imagine trying to do that for hour upon hour upon hour, the autopilot makes long distance travel in an aircraft possible. In fact, if the autopilot is in op in an air carrier aircraft, they limit the altitude the aircraft can fly because of how important the autopilot is to fly in the aircraft. It's very important. But today, moving forward, with the advances in technology, we see autopilots in everything. In fact, when we look at aircraft that are manufactured today, what used to be a very expensive option to be installed in an aircraft for glass cockpit aircraft, digital aircraft, they're standard equipment because the technology is so much cheaper and more capable. Even autopilots can be found in the smallest of these unmanned autonomous vehicles or UAVs. But it wasn't that long ago that these systems were very expensive and complicated to operate. And they were very rare on general aviation aircraft. For me, <clears throat> My life changed when I traded up from my old 1958-172 to my new PA-23, <clears throat> my 1955 Piper Toronto. Not only did I get to pick up an extra engine, but I also got my first chance to operate an aircraft with an autopilot. Talk about electric sex. Now, it was only a Century 2B two-axis autopilot. But it was a great learning tool. This simple system is called two axis because it only operated in two of the three aviation axis that an aircraft could be controlled under. But it was definitely better than hand flying an aircraft in crowded airspace under IFR, especially when you had to change charts at the time. This is before electronic charts, finding maps, finding frequencies on charts, keeping your head down, keeping your scan up on the instruments, the autopilot made a world of difference, especially even in a 1955 aircraft. Now, we're going to go over this S-Tech autopilot, sorry, it's a Century B autopilot in a minute. But let's talk about those three axes that an autopilot control and what we talk about as far as whether we have a single axis, double axis, or three axis. So the first one and the most basic autopilot will be the single axis autopilot. This is the one that only controls the aircraft in the roll axis. Now these types of autopilots will be connected to the ailerons only, and these are primarily used to, for keeping the wings level. Now some higher end single axis autopilots will go through and be connected to some sort of heading control, like for example, a gyro, um, that might have a, a, a directional gyro with a heading bug on it. And the autopilot can make minor turns left and right to follow a heading. Or it could be connected to a VOR radio signal or an ILS radio signal for lateral navigation. So in the autopilot world, we say LNAV or lateral navigation. We're talking about that navigation in a lateral plane, as if you're flying across the ground over, uh, using a map. A two-channel autopilot will have all the capability of the one channel, but now we're going to add a second channel around the aircraft's lateral axis. Now, this axis is one that rotates the aircraft in the pitch moment, and it's going to be connected to the aircraft's elevators. Now, the most basic pitch function is altitude hold, which was basically the only vertical navigation available in some of these earlier autopilots. And they would just simply lock on to a pressure altitude that the pilot select when you select the altitude hold. Now, autopilots today that have the ability to calculate climb and descent of the full two channel will be called, they'll have what we call VNAV capability or vertical nav capability, which means 
it can control the aircraft in altitude control. I've seen some of these things that can actually go through within programming. I mean, just by pushing a button on the keyboard, uh, and this goes back to the mid-90s on a 757, to where it could be programmed to program a rate of descent to put the aircraft at a uh, waypoint at the exact altitude, let's say so many miles away. Very capable. That is a VNAV, and a VNAV is in pitch control around the lateral axis of the aircraft. Now, the vertical axis is the full three-axis autopilots, but the system is actually a very separate, self-contained uh, unit called the yaw damper or yaw damper system. This is a switch in the cockpit. It's basically on or off, but it is very important to the pilot, especially for large aircraft that fly at high altitudes that have swept wings. And the purpose of the yawn damper is to help compensate for that upset around the vertical axis when an aileron is deflected either to make a turn or when just simply controlling the aircraft in turbulence. Now, especially in high speed swept wing jets, adverse yaw can cause a systematic or cyclic uh, thing called a Dutch roll. Let me show it here. In this demonstration, what we're looking at is a, a three-engine swept wing jet flying low, and it's showing with the rudders not uh, being operated, I would say, rolling the ailerons. When you're rolling the ailerons with no rudder input, what happens is that you'll see that the aileron that is pulling down will actually pull the nose toward the down aileron, and then vice versa. So the pilot here is just rotating the ailerons back around, and you can see the nose pivoting around. Here's a better shot of it. However, if the ailerons were then coupled to the yaw damper system, then the aircraft would still roll, but it would roll in sequence with the heading not changing. It's itself its own system. It's designed to operate the rudder only automatically. And when it does, it has its own internal gyro that's, that's sensitive to rotation around the vertical axis. As the aircraft rotates around the vertical axis, the yaw damper will move the rudder to compensate for that adverse yaw when it happens, whenever it deflects. Now, at high altitude, um, the roll channel is very limited in um, in the amount of deflection because it is possible if you put too much deflection to roll an airplane over. And this has been seen in some very high profile accidents in the past. Well, let's talk about the three basic types of autopilot systems that are used in aircraft today. Position-based, rate-based, and then digital autopilots. Now, the uh, the position-based autopilot shown here is where it uses an attitude gyro for the sense element for control of the autopilot in both pitch and roll. So when the aircraft becomes upset, the autopilot will read the changes in position of the mass of the gyro as it spins. This will send a signal to the actuators through the autopilot computer to move the aircraft back into position. Now, position-based will also work in both roll and pitch uh, control. So it'll also, in addition to bringing it back to zero in turbulence, some autopilots or more capable autopilots will also set a turn bank angle when maneuvering the aircraft in lateral navigation, either head and hold or when navigating on a VOR or an ILS, where we talk about, let's we'll say, localizer or approach mode. We're going to get to those in a second. Now, what we're showing here on the screen is uh, examples of a um, STEC autopilot. Sorry, yes, I got STEC on the head. Terribly sorry. A Sentry B autopilot, where we have to the lower left of the screen is the autopilot controller. Above that is the nav selector. Next to the attitude indicator, which has the horizontal and the, and the land and sea air. And then below that on the bottom right is the directional gyro. So these are the systems that need to be used in the aircraft system, in the aircraft to be able to operate. 
we go back to how long the position-based autopilot's been around, it has been around a long, longest time because this is actually one of the oldest versions of an autopilot used in aircraft. Now, it was first successfully used, created by Lawrence Sperry back in 1914. Now, you actually had earlier models that were used for uh, heading control for ships. So Sperry had been advancing his technology in making a two-axis autopilot at the time. And it was interesting to let you know the two-axis in this case wasn't really the role, was more that they would change the aircraft's heading by using the... Uh, rudder at the time but the pitch was also divined into it designed into it so it keeps the airplane level so the first one here is was installed in a curtis c2 biplane with a seaplane fuselage now this design was chosen because glenn curtis design were based on making an aircraft with natural stability built in now by contrast the right designs were purposely created to be unstable requiring constant pilot input. Now, the whole point of an autopilot is to assist the aircraft in maintaining its heading and attitude um, by just simply augmenting the aircraft's built-in stability. To be able to be installed in a right aircraft, which was inherently unstable, it would cause constant control changes. And they could, they just quite frankly, autopilots at the time were just not fast enough. So the position-based system would augment the aircraft's stable flying characteristics. Now, the, sh the picture here is an interesting one. It's shown during a flyby demonstration down a river during a competition in June of that year, where both the pilot is holding both of his hands in the air, and the flying mechanic actually walked out onto the wing during the entire five-mile pass down the river, totally unaided. The autopilot system had maintained the aircraft's uh, directional control and attitude control totally self-sufficiently. Now, I am writing an autopilot and flight director textbook, which will have the whole story of this competition in it, if you're interested in it. Let's talk about the second most common. This is a great autopilot system that was invented later than the standard system, that was the rate-based autopilot. This was invented to be installed on general aviation aircraft that didn't have autopilot systems already installed. Now this system in reality is a two, has two independent systems that share a control panel and can be installed without altering the original aircraft's flight control system meaning that the pitch servo and the roll servos that are installed in the aircraft are bridled onto the aircraft. Again, that's actually described in my textbook of how these are installed. We actually do an installation of the STEC autopilot system for my classes. You'll see the control head in the center of the screen. You have um, a lateral navigation instruments on the left and right. You have the gyro with the heading mode. And then you have the VOR indicator uh, showing the fact that we could use that type of lateral navigation. Again, we'll get into that system check later. This particular model, which is the S, uh, they call it the S20 or the S30, would have a separate or independent pitch computer in it that would actually control the aircraft in basically altitude hold using the absolute pressure transducer, uh, but not in pitch control when it talks about the aircraft being upset. The theory of operation of the system is that when an aircraft is sensing a turn in any direction, this will be felt by the turn coordinator. This in turn will trigger the ailerons to move to stop the turn. So this would be in its wings leveler mode. Another name for wings, another name for wings leveler is called the control steel control wheel steering mode or CWS mode. This is where the autopilot will hold the aircraft in the position the system was engaged. So if it was already in a five degree turn, for example, and the pilot were to go through and engage the stability mode, which is called this thing, the airplane would just maintain that five degree angle of bank and rotate the turn. Now, as I mentioned before, the pitch channel is a separate system that will operate in altitude hold function. When the altitude hold mode is selected, <clears throat> this will set the absolute pressure transducer to a null voltage. Then the pitch computer will monitor the voltage 
should the aircraft begin to climb, the voltage in the transducer will change. This will trigger a pitch computer input, which will send a signal to the pitch servo to move the elevator down. The aircraft will begin to descend. When the zero or null voltage is reached again, then the servo will stop driving and the aircraft will level out. Now, something that happens quite common as an aircraft flies along is that while the fuel is burning off, the aircraft's pitch trim balance will change. Well, remember I told you the servo, the pitch servo is attached to the elevator control. If the servo has to hold constant pressure on the, uh, on the cables, what happens is that it'll actually su uh, submit a trim or out of trim condition, which will turn on the light in the control head, telling the pilot to retrim the pitch until the light goes out. And there's a trim up and trim down light. Again, we're going to get into that as we go through and do a check. Now, modern autopilot systems today, in both large aircraft and small aircraft, any aircraft that really has glass cockpit, is a new digital system. These new systems no longer use the heavy spinning gyros, but now will use position information generated by solid state devices. <clears throat> Early non-digital systems used many different LRUs in the equipment base to collect and analyze the data to provide information to the autopilot systems for all these same modes. In the diagram here, we're showing the M59 module, that's the gyro. There'll be three of those in the aircraft. And as the aircraft changes, it sends that gyro position information to one of many computers, depending on pitch, roll, or yaw, depending on the information needed in the uh, equipment bay. Also, henceforth, you'll see another box in here with hoses connected to it. That's the air data computer, which would provide the altitude hold function information. So you have all these um, you have all these LRUs in the equipment bay that are all tied together and have to operate together to provide the interlocks for the autopilot system to operate. Well, today the heavy gyros are prone to drift and precession. Well, today we're using these non, uh, non-mass solid state devices that measure motion electronically. And I've got two examples here. Well, one device on the left side of the screen is called a ring laser gyro. And this would actually, it would sense rotation about its axis. Um, and there'd be three of these and in, in, installed in a um, attitude heading reference, AHARS box. And the way these things work is that they measure motion by using phase shifts in light frequency. And then a computer will convert that light frequency shift into a motion value that a gyro used to do by simply repositioning it. These making this much more sensitive than the original mechanical gyros. Now, another new solid state sensing elements are these digital accelerometers. Digital accelerometers also measure changes in motion using a piezoelectric voltage sensor. Now, you'd be surprised at where these accelerometers are located. What do you think is used to rotate your phone when you turn it? There are these piezoelectric uh, accelerometers all over your phone. There'll be three of them, or in your iPad, or anything else. In fact, they'll be located in that little, little mini UAS I showed you before. This is a fairly large one. So between the ring laser gyros and the piezoelectrics, we now have full digital solid state controls of our flight control systems. But we're going to go through and concentrate really basically on typical general aviation. The reason for that is because I don't want you to get into the large air carrier glass cockpit systems without me having a maintenance manual. So that's a whole new section, a whole new video. We talk about air carrier troubleshooting of an autopilot. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the system checks of a basic position-based autopilot system and a rate-based autopilot system and the different types that you have in the aircraft. Now, one of the first things to understand about performing a ground check on an autopilot system is that you need to understand there's going to be different interlocks or conditions that have to be met before the autopilot system can be turned on. Now, an interlock is a safety feature built into the autopilot 
to ensure that the aircraft is in a safe condition to engage the autopilot. For example, you don't want to engage the autopilot while the flight controls are in a turn and you've got it programmed to do straight level. Or you don't want to, you don't want to engage the nav mode if it doesn't have a navigation signal coming to the autopilot system. So these interlocks or these, these conditions provide safety, safety release of the aircraft. And we need to understand that before we do the checks. Now, more complex and larger aircraft, the more interlocks they have. For example, I can't engage an autopilot less than 200 feet on a 727 because it has a restriction from auto land, right? No aircraft can auto land. So it has an automatic disconnect function. I can't run it on the ground. I need a radio altimeter simulator to be able to put the airplane at 200 feet. Then I can engage the autopilot on a 727. So like I said, every airplane is going to be different uh, to be able to do the checks. But we're just going to go ahead and play with this first this uh, Sentry 3B on the other side. So we're going to start with this older model position-based system. There are still a bunch of these flying around there in the system right now. So to get started, you need to apply power to the system, and then you must wait long enough to the gyros to come up to speed, the fully erect. Now, the problem in this particular aircraft, in this particular system, since the attitude indicator is the main uh, sensing source, Unless there is an electric backup in the vacuum system, you may have to run an engine to be able to provide the vacuum to get the gyro up to speed. Now, once the gyro is fully erect, and a gyro that's not erect after you first start up is that you've seen it kind of has this rhythmic motion as it's kind of trying to find its center where it's starting. It'll be considered fully erect when the when the gyro is no longer hunting or actually will lock in. Now, vertical gyros will also spin a little bit as they get up to speed, but then eventually once, they, once the vertical gyro and the horizontal gyro, the directional gyro, are stable, and then we can go on to our next check. Now, with the gyros aligned in the flight controls trimmed, must be neutral, which means that we're sitting on the ground. Now, I want to go through and look at the panel here. On the panel, these are rocker switches, and they'll have locks in them, so uh, little electric locks. So if all the interlocks or the interconnections are met, the roll channel, you push it up, it'll hold and stay in place. That means the autopilot will be engaged. Same thing with heading, altitude, and pitch control. Now, roll has to be engaged before you can engage autopilot when we go on the sequence. Same thing. Once roll and heading are engaged, then I can I can either do altitude hold or manual pitch one or the other when it goes below. Below that is a, uh, a you'll see a left and a right knob there that allows to manually turn or rotate the aircraft left and right using that knob. And a lot of autopilots have this. In other words, when you're in the what's called the control wheel steering mode rotating this knob below the switch will allow you to essentially fly the aircraft. To the right of it, you'll see a window named trim. That's a little straight line inside a round window. Okay, When we're checking the pitch control, the trim has to be neutral, which means that line needs to be straight across before I can engage the pitch mode. Once the pitch mode is engaged, then I can, and not in altitude hold, not the second button to the, from the end, but the from the right, but the last button on the right. Then I can actually manually pitch the airplane up and down using the autopilot with the thumb wheel on the right hand side of the screen. Now we're going to go through the checks here in a second. I just want to let you know. Okay, so there is the um, there is the control panel for the autopilot. Now this turns it on and off. If you really look straight below and to the right, you'll see a nav control head. When you're in the heading mode, HDG mode, you can actually select what heading source you want to use. The directional gyro, the VOR, the localizer, or the um, uh, VOR localizer, or any other nav. Back in those days, you could tie it to a uh, Loran at the time. Okay, so... The first thing you do is make sure everything is in trim and neutral, which includes the pitch control. Now, in the sentry system, there is a trim indicator, like I showed you before, that's that small line in the round window. 
the technician needs to move by hand the elevator control until that indicator in the window is level. It takes a little bit of, of skill here because not every elevator controls what we call balance. Some of them are what we consider ground heavy. In other words, they may have an aerodynamic balance when you fly, but when you're testing the system on the ground, you have to actually lift up the elevator into that neutral position to be able to engage it on the ground. So, and that also will need to be held so you could feel it move up and down against the servos when we get ready to do the pitch channel chest test. Now, when everything is up and running, the first roll channel can be engaged. When the switch is in the locked position, meaning that everything is set, Everything is neutral. The knob between the left and right is neutral. The ailerons are neutral. The pitch is neutral. That down and up thumb wheel is neutral, right? Then you go ahead and engage the autopilot. If everything is fine, the autopilot roll channel will stay engaged. Okay. When it's locked, you can turn that knob left and right, and you should observe that the ailerons will move left to right. Now, do not move the ailerons very far all the way because most of the older actuators are really not strong enough to fully move the ailerons on the ground. Um, they really are designed to work in with aerodynamic load. So just rotate them left, rotate them, rotate them right, rotate them left, just to make sure that, that they're functioning. Then the next mode, with the roll channel engaged, you're going to go and select a heading mode. Okay, but before you can do that, we've got a selector at the bottom. So in this case here, Starting from left to left to right, I've got the nav mode, which could be GPS, which could be Loran at the time. Omni mode is VOR Omni bearing system, so that would come from a left right deflection. Heading mode would come from the directional gyro shown here. And then LOC stands for localizer, and localizer normal allows the autopilot to fly a what we call a front course into the runway. And localizer reverse actually will reverse the aileron's turning conditions to a fly a back course, where you, instead of flying toward the needle on the front course, you would fly away from the needle to center it on the back course. Well, the autopilot's allowed to do that. It can do that. Okay, so in this case here, we're going to test the heading mode first. So the first thing we need to do is, one, we hopefully our gyro, a directional gyro is spooled up. And if you look on the directional gyro, you'll see a small triangle. The lower line is the red diamond above it. In other words, it's the fixed line that points over the heading. In this case here, the aircraft is pointing to the north. To move the lower, uh, to move the, sorry, the heading bug, which is a little triangle, you got to push that knob and turn it and rotate it. And then you can line it under the lubber line. So before you can engage <clears throat> the heading mode, that's got to be aligned other the lubber line. Once it's there, then you could press the heading mode. If it's lined up, the heading mode will lock and the button and the rocker switch will stay in place. Now at this point, you could take and push and rotate the bug left and right against the lower line, and you should see the ailerons move left and right accordingly. Okay. Now, with the roll channel and a heading channel engaged, either one or the other one, we can now go through and check the localizer normal. Now, the important part here is that we need to be already tuned to a VOR station. Sometimes you could do this on the ground. VOR stations could be uh, close to the ground, or a localizer station. Now, the trouble with doing this test on the ground to a localizer is localizers only go left and right. You have to have a piece of test equipment that'll simulate one or two, three dots left or one or two, three dots right. Now, if you're in the omni mode, you can just rotate the omni bearing selector to move that needle left and right, and then the autopilot will rotate the ailerons left and right according to it when you're in the omni mode. So like I said, if you're in the localizer mode, you must have a piece of test equipment that can simulate left and right on the mode. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, well, that's all I want to say about that. Just make sure that the needle is centered before you engage that mode so the autopilot doesn't go off um, 
into its netherland. And if you do the localized reverse mode, make sure you have the tester set up for the reverse mode. The other thing I need to probably tell you here is that when you're going left and right on the needle, remember that's a slow motion on the needle is a large motion in the aircraft. So make sure that the uh, that you use small changes to just look to make sure that the system is rolling left and rolling right. Okay. Now let's check the pitch channel with everything up and running. And you can do this with either the heading mode or the roll mode, uh, either one. So we're going to go through and engage the pitch channel. Okay. This is going to be the manual pitch. And just like we talked about before, with the technician holding the elevator control, moving the trim needle to make sure that that needle is perfectly horizontal. Then you would go through and move the rocker switch into the pitch mode. What this does is it activates the pitch thumb wheel to the right of the control panel. If it sticks, if it's engaged, then you should be able to move the pitch handle down, which means the control will go forward, move the pitch handle back, and the control comes back. Okay, That checks the pitch control. Now, for altitude lock, you would go through and then press altitude hold. You still have to have pitch engaged, but... To be able to test that function on the ground, you would have to have a pedostatic box or a static system hooked up to the transducer and then move it up and move it down to test that system. It's not anything that's normally done as a pre-flight function. But that takes care of the Sentry. In this case, it's a Sentry 3, Sentry 2B autopilots. So there's still a bunch of them around. Now, I did have a situation to where I was called out to troubleshoot this autopilot system. And, you know, God bless them. They went through and replaced the attitude indicator, the mechanical one with a glass cockpit one. Well, unfortunately, when you take that out of the airplane and you put the glass cockpit one in, it was, I figured it was a Garmin indicator that put in, you lost your sense source for this autopilot and basically rendered it inoperative. It was never going to capture. So if you do upgrade part of your instrument panel to glass cockpit, you're going to need to keep this um, attitude indicator somewhere else on the cockpit, on, the, on the, the first officer, the co-pilot side, if you will. So let's move on to the STEC. So these are the rate-based systems, and I'm going to pick on these two because these are two very common systems that are installed in aircraft. Now, the one on the left-hand side, that is the 20s and 30s. Uh, 20s being with pitch, 30s being with, uh, so 20s being without pitch, excuse me, and the 30 being with pitch. And on the right hand side, the center of the screen, is the STEC model 40 and 50. 40 being without altitude function, 50 being with altitude function. Okay. So on the 20s and 30s, you can recognize it mostly because it'll has the turn coordinator displayed on it. On the uh, the more modern one, it just has a more up-to-date uh, uh, display panel on it and more individual sections on it. So when you look at the two systems side by side, again, that major difference is that the pitch channel for the 20s and 30s uh, is an add-on, but not part of the, or not installed in the computer. While the 40s and 50s, uh, 40s without, 50s with, will have its pitch electronics located inside the computer. Now, the issue is with the larger computer in the mode, now the turn coordinator has to be separate on the on the modern system as opposed to being integral on the first side. Another difference, and I want to show you the two sides here. On the uh, left-hand side of the screen is the model 2030s, and the right-hand screen is the 40s, 50s. And like I said, um, the big, they all have the same basic issue, except if you look at the bottom, the pitch computer, pitch server, and absolute transducer just simply sends a signal of on, off, and trim out of trim to the control head. Versus on the other S40 and 50 on the right hand side of the screen, torque coordinator is now uh, separate, and uh, all the other servos actually drive to it also because it controls the servo. Uh, one thing I want to keep in mind here is that on the, the STEC uh, 40s and 50s, you'll see an autopilot master switch where up is test and down um, 
Let me rephrase that. Up is on, middle is off, and down is test. This actually has a self-test function in it. Well, the S20 and 30 does too, but they're tested a little bit different. We're going to go through the ground check. So if you look at it, it can be, uh, on going back to the 20 and 30, you can have uh, HSI. HSI will run both the NAV, VOR localizer, or uh, the heading select, or it could be a gyro by itself, or you can have a separate VOR localizer or GPS indicator to drive it. So it's cap capable of any one of those systems. You could have an, uh, a remote autopilot uh, disconnect switch. It's optional because you can always disconnect it from the control panel. It's nice to have it over the thumb on the control yoke. And it also has a remote altitude hold switch if you've got that put in. Well, if you go back and look on the right-hand side toward the bottom, it has this also has the same optional remote disconnect for the yoke and then an automatic or remote uh, altitude engage button also. So both of them have the same features. The big difference is that the pitch computer drives the pitch servo uh, on the 20s and 30s, while the power for the pitch servo comes from the main controller itself. And we'll get to that here in a second. So let's start with a basic function check. So the control for the 20s and 30s on the right-hand side is controlled basically with one knob. The knob on it, if you look at it closely, it says push, hold, is the autopilot disconnect. So when you push it once, you push it, hold it for more than three seconds, it automatically disconnects the autopilot. When you push it slightly, that actually sets its mode. So if you push it fairly quickly, um, it'll go to stabilization, ST, which is that control wheel steering. Push it again, advances it to heading. Push it again, goes into whatever nav tracking system is connected at the time, which means you'll need to have an external switch. In other words, it can only take one nav uh, input at a time, GPS, VOR. If it's a ILS, then you'll have to go through and change it from low to high sense. Okay, because ILSs are uh, high sense. In other words, they're really sensitive when you get close versus normal tracking is low sense. So that's the track. Moving across that screen, you're going to see the up and down trim lights. It just tells the pilot the aircraft's out of trim. Now, the, if you, the, you'll see the little airplane and the wings level. That's a standard turn coordinator. It operates like a turn coordinator, but it's also the main sense element. And you go down, and that ball is the, what, the, what it is. It's the, it's the ball, the needle ball and airspeed that's in a, a standard turn coordinator. Okay. Also, getting back to that upper left-hand button up there, you push the mode, but you'd also, once it's in stabilization, then you could rotate that knob left and right, and it'll actually stern turn the aircraft using the uh, uh, roll servos left and right, just like the Aztec I showed you before. So let's look at the functional preflight of this unit, uh, the Aztec, the, the lesser unit. So first things first is that it must be adequate DC voltage. Uh, this thing is designed to operate in both 14 or 28 volts DC. To perform these checks, if you have low voltage, it'll actually affect the function of the pre-flight procedures. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to turn on the autopilot master switch to on. And what that does, this is a separate switch that's on the, on the instrument panel. Um, and I showed you, I'm going to go back to that. And that's autopilot master switch on, on the right-hand diagram. So that'll be on or off. It doesn't, it's a little different than the other Aztec, but it's just on or off. When you first turn it on, the ready, which is the green light, the stabilization yellow, heading yellow, low, and track lights will temporarily illuminate on the enunciator panel. Now, after seven seconds, all the lamps will go out. And what's happening is the gyro is beginning to spin up, the electric gyro. After about one to two minutes, the green ready light will illuminate, indicating that the autopilot can be engaged. Now, again, with everything 
neutralized on the flight controls. Flight controls neutralized, an elevator neutralized. You can go ahead. Remember, you don't have to worry about pitch at this point. You press the autopilot push mode on button once. You just press it one time. This will put the aircraft in stabilization mode and the ST lamp will, in will uh, illuminate. Rotate the turn knob, which is that same knob you pushed, left and then right and determine that the control wheel moves left and right. Center the mode select knob. It should remain motionless. You shouldn't see any, any motions. Now, if it has the DG installed, place the heading bug under the lower line. Now, the beauty of this test is the engine actually doesn't have to be running. You can go ahead and move the lubber line underneath the, uh, let me go with rotates. You go ahead and move the lubber line back underneath the um, directional gyro and the um, autopilot's just simply looking to the reference between the bug and the lubber line. Press and release the mode select and the HD light will illuminate. Now you can move the heading bug left and right, and you see the flight control ailerons move left and right. Now there's next an overwrite test. So you grab the control wheel and slowly try to overpower the roll servo left and right. What you're checking here is you want to ensure that there's proper clutch action. These general aviation ones have clutch drags where you could actually grab, if you get a runaway um, autopilot system, you should be able to grab the flight control and continue to fly the airplane. This particular system, remember, as I told you, when you installed it, it bridles onto the original aircraft uh, cabling for the flight controls. You don't have to uh, cut the flight controls or change them. But when you move the controls left and right, you should feel tension. It, sh it should be smooth when it comes in. If you feel any drag or anything, that means the clutch is probably being wore out in one area. If you also feel any unusual noise, then you've got a bad clutch. Now, when we get into air carrier aircraft, um, when you go through and try to overpower a flight control, it's designed to automatically shut off or click off the... Um, um, autopilot system and actually we'll, we'll, we'll turn it off. So the next check that we're going to do, let's do the radio check. So now we're going to go through and find, hopefully it will be within sight of a valid VOR signal. So you take your Omni selector, make sure your switch, the selector switch, if it's not, if it's using more than one, if it's using either GPS, VOR, or um, localizer, make sure that the selector switch for the nav control is in one of those three positions. Then center, pick up the uh, VOR signal, center the Omni bearing selector, and then one time press and release the mode select knob again. The first time you do it should be the low track lamp. Now move very slowly the Omni bearing selector left and right so the CDI needle moves left and right. And just watch and make sure that the control wheel moves left and right as if it's trying to fly toward the needle. Now, press and release the mode select knob one more time, and this should uh, mode or should change the mode to high track lamp. And you'll see that light comes off. And you do the same test left and right. Now the control wheel response should be slightly faster in the high track than it was in the low track mode. That's how you tell, know the difference between your own localizer versus a VOR. So now, Press and hold the mode select knob and press and hold it. And the autopilot should disconnect. And then it says, you know, repeat the test using an optional autopilot control, uh, autopilot control dismount on the control, uh, flight control. Okay. As the autopilot disconnects, the ready light will flash with a five second audible beep tone. So it tells you that you've mainly disconnected the autopilot and you go, Beep, 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 beep. You hear a tone that talks about the disconnect. It's kind of a high-pitched tone. So that's the basic check of the older model S20, S30. But let's take a look at the System 40 pre-flight test. So we do some sets. If you have a yaw damper system in the aircraft, hit the yaw damper switch to off if you have it. Select battery switch on. And then you're going to set 
the avionics master switch to on position. Okay, what that does, it kind of pre-charges or kind of presets the um, the computer to on. Then you're going to move the switch down to the test position. What will happen is the stabilization, heading, nav, approach, and then if it has if it has altitude, altitude and reverse enunciators will all appear. And then the ready lamp will illuminate on the display shown here. Again, if it has the altitude function built into it, you'll also see, excuse me, uh, you also see the up and down trim indications that come on. All right. So what happens? You'll set the autopilot master switch to on. That all enunciations, oops, let me turn my thing, all the enunciations will go out. And this is what you see. As the gyros start getting spooled up and the system gets worn up, within three minutes, you should see, boom, the green ready light is ready to go. That means that the autopilot is ready to engage. Again, with all the flight controls neutral, then you could press the on off button below the mode enunciators. When you press that, the autopilot will go into its first mode. Okay. And the first mode will be stabilization. Okay. Now, with it in the stabilization mode, but where the button where the button says push, you could go through and rotate that knob left and right, and the flight control should should follow left and right. Excuse me. Okay. Now the push symbol on it allows you to cycle between stabilization or control wheel steering mode and heading select mode. So what we're going to do now is that we'll press the heading select mode. Okay, remember, have the index um, under the, the lubber line under the bug, so the two that are lined up. So what will happen then is that now when you go through and one thing I forgot to mention, let me go back, I'm sorry. <laughs> when you're in the ready mode and nothing is connected, remember, the pilot's going to do a positive control check they're going to move it full left, mole right, just to make sure that the roll and pitch servo is not connected right, yet. Then when you turn it on, then you're going to go through and do the roll check and make sure that you can um, uh, override but feel the clutch. In other words, it's going to it has the slip function the same as the other one. Then you'll rotate the left and right knob and make sure the, co uh, the control wheel turns left and right to match the, uh, the stables in the stabilization mode, just to go through to get actually just fly the airplane. When we set it back to under its zero index or match up the arrows again, make sure the thing stops and it doesn't have any shake or anything like that. Now, if the AC is equipped with the heading system, either HSI or DG, then we're going to go through and do the heading mode check, which means we're going to go through and push the heading bug once the heading set is set under the lubber line. Okay. If it works, the heading mode, the stabilization will go out, the heading light will come on, and now you should be able to turn the um, heading bug left and right against the lubber line, and you should see the ailerons move left and right as it show as it's shown here okay. again be careful about doing too much turn left and right because it does get to the point where if you get too far away from the lubber line sometimes the the uh, autopilot will get confused and will kind of will stop and you have to maybe go back and reset it but once the lubber is centered then you go through and make sure it lines in now the next check we're going to do is the VOR check. If you can't tune to a local VOR frequency on the nav receiver, then you'll need to have a box on it. Uh, the uh, the signal generator and IFR 
I believe it's an IFR 4000 is one I'd used before in our school, which just allows you to, to put a, uh, a VOR frequency on it. So now we're going to go and press the nav button with the needle centered the nav button should engage so now that means that you can rotate the omni bearing selector slightly left slightly right and the aileron should move slightly left and slightly right and you're good to go then to go and change it back to its approach mode these will go through and you're going to look at the two buttons. Again, you're going to use the signal generator. You're going to tune to the ILS frequency and then put in a centered indication. Now you're going to go down and hit the APR button. When you hit the APR button with the needle centered, this is what we're showing here. Okay. When you go through on the signal generator on the test, go ahead and do like one dot to the left. The autopilot then should turn to the left. Move it back to center, the autopilot centers up, move it back to the right, and the autopilot goes to the right. So the ailerons should follow where the test set is putting the course deviation indicator or the needle. And don't get any more than two dots off between left and right when doing the check. So now the next check is we're going to do the pitch system check. So first things first before we do anything is we're going to push the flight controls forward and back to make sure that the pitch servo is not connected. Now on aircraft with the pitch controls, you'll see an ALT button right above the other button. When you press that button, that should activate um, the altitude engage switch. What that means is now when you press it, you're in altitude hold mode in this particular setup. It doesn't have VNAV per se. It's just simply altitude hold. And it shows up here. Now, uh, there's no way to go through and thumb wheel. Remember, this is a rate-based gyro, not a position-based gyro. So what you're going to have to do is to go through and just attempt to move the control wheel forward and aft and understand and just feel that the pitch servo is engaged but you can override the pitch uh, servo. In other words, this, the clutch is not so tight that it, uh, it stays. Or if it's too tight, it might actually uh, 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 disconnect the autopilot, and that means it needs to be repaired. Now, move the control wheel as far forward as you can and hold for three seconds. After three seconds, you'll see the up trim light flashes. After that, move it aft until the light goes down. Okay, then do the same thing. Pull it full aft for three seconds and see that if the down trim light comes on. So that's really basically the whole pitch system check for this airplane. It's, it is only a um, altitude hold function on this, air, this aircraft, which is not bad in this system. It's not bad. Okay, but I want to talk about uh, a little bit briefly here. Now, and that was all there was to the rate-based system and the position-based system of a typical G aircraft. However, for modern autopilot systems and aircraft today, you're going to have to have test equipment to be able to hook up the aircraft. You're going to have to have access to hydraulic systems when you're hooking up. You're going to be moving the ailerons. Um, there's a lot of prep that goes in in testing an autopilot system on these large air carrier aircraft. Um, things like if you're in a hangar and people are walking around, you don't want to have them um, get in a situation where they get hit in the head. Also, you can be, we have different modes of activations or different modes of operation between flaps down and flaps up. Um, there's going to be, like I said, there's going to be other types of, of lockouts and test functions for autopilots based on the complexity of the aircraft and how the system works. But on this aircraft here, if you look at the very top of the screen here, this is a next gen 737. That is the VNAV and LNAV with the auto throttle um, control panel on the top. In my avionics or uh, autopilot uh, textbook, I have whole chapters on how to fun use the functions, 
um, how to set up the autopilot system and test the LNAV and VNAV functions on the displays here. So that's something to look forward to when I get my, my uh, autopilot book published here. And I hope to get it done by in a couple months. I just I have all the information. When I created my avionics program, I had 650 hours of, of material that were created and an entire five weeks was dedicated to autopilot, autopilot install and uh, flight director and we also did uh, FADEC, Full Authority Digital System Control, and ACARS. And, um, ACARS systems, not ACARS, I'm sorry, EECs, Engine Electronic Controls. Sorry, ACARS. So that's going to be for a future class. The next section I want to talk about here is common problems with autopilot systems and being able to understand what happens when you have an emergency. Now, if I have a vacuum failure and I have a STEC autopilot, meaning electrically op autopilot. Now, if it's a Century 2, Century 3B, when the gyro begins to rotate and lose power and lose headings, the autopilot actually would disconnect on the Century. On the uh, on the STEC autopilots, because they're electrics, okay, if you lose vacuum control, okay, I got no directional gyro, for this system, it has no impact on my autopilot. But, if I lose vacuum and I'm my directional gyro is vacuum driven, then I won't have the heading bug or the heading bug won't be um, uh, reliable. So what I don't want to do is have the heading. So that's a vacuum system failure. If I lose all electrics, then it kills the autopilot after a short amount of time. Now, uh, these on a fort on a, what we say the 12 volt systems, it can actually operate down to nine volt discharge before the red flag comes on and then the autopilot turn becomes unreliable. However, if you lose electrical power, that is one device that is no longer a friend to you unless you're an IFR. Um, you want to shut off that to save electrical power and be able to use it. So a solution on that, when you lose electrical power, you're gonna hand fly the airplane, sorry. If you get static system ice, this is only going to affect the altitude hold function. So what happens if my altitude, my altitude static source port for the absolute pressure transducer for the altitude hold freezes over? Well, that's, that's like freezing that pressure in time. So if the airplane begins to drift down, for example, starts to lose altitude, well, the pressure transducer won't see that and just simply maintain the aircraft in level flight. And this could be dangerous. <laughs> so the other thing that happens is people will be flying along, the airplane will drift down, and then the ice will melt off. And that causes a large change. In other words, then you have that, that quick change in pressure in the transducer, and that could cause an, an upset in the aircraft's system. So that just means that if I... No, I have fuselage ice and I'm blocked over. Uh, in other words, I'm descending when, when I'm not, when I shouldn't be. And some of my other instruments are telling me I'm descending. Shut off your altitude hold and concentrate on your altimeter at that point. Now, this is an interesting one because this is a lot of stuff. Autopilot failure or erratic behavior. If your autopilot is simply just shutting off uh, for whatever reason in flight, um, or it's doing weird things, uh, weird things. What are considered weird things? Well, uh, in the roll mode, it just simply won't level out after a turn. Um, this could be a computer problem. This could be a servo problem. Okay. In other words, it begins right hand turn, and when, and then when it's supposed to intercept uh, a needle, for example, on the nav mode, and it just keeps flying past, you could have a navigation input problem uh, on that channel, or you could have a roll channel. In other words, it could go left, but it won't go right. Another common problem with these autopilots um, is that it overshoots or undershoots turns left and right, or it has something called a porpoise. In other words, in the altitude hold mode, the airplane will porpoise, it'll go up and down. It'll have a hard time tracking. And um, if it's an autopilot system for that airplane, okay, then you're talking about computer electronic problems, then I'd be pulling the control head out or the, or the pitch computer out, depending on if it's a roll problem or a pitch problem, uh, or if it's all in one in the, uh, in the 40 and 50 Aztec. Okay. However, a lot of people are buying 
um, autopilot systems from other airplanes. No bueno. An autopilot system, first of all, if you're going to install it on an aircraft, it has to be STC'd for that aircraft. Because the aerodynamic feedback loading of the controls to the autopilot system is tested to the aircraft, the specific aircraft. Um, you'll have minor variances between a 182 and a 180 and things like that, a 172. But if I've got a longer fuselage aircraft, like a 206, then that's going to completely override the servo's ability to track and hold altitude or roll. So you never want to try to put <clears throat> an autopilot system, and I mean the servos and the computer, in an aircraft that it's not STC or approved for it by the manufacturer. The other thing is, don't mix and match your servos. If the servos may look alike, they may have the same part number, but you're going to see slight different variations in the dash number of the part numbers because, again, the computers are going to be matched to the servos that are going to be matched to the aircraft. So we always want to make sure that we have a, a matching system and that we're putting on the right parts. Otherwise, the autopilot will not act like it normally should or where, where it should. Again, first things first, if you're having a problem with the autopilot of flight, shut it off and don't turn it back on again. Now, also keep in mind, even though you turn off the autopilot, on the s 30 and 40, it has the built-in um, uh, turn coordinator. It actually will continue to function as a turn coordinator as long as it has voltage and RPM. So, in other words, there's a little flag on the front of it. I'll go back to it, and I'll show you that. There's a There it is. Next to the word track, there's a red flag. When it's up to full voltage, greater than 9 volts, and it's up to speed, you can even shut off the autopilot for Iraq behavior, but as long as that red red flag is out of view, the turn coordinator is actually working. So uh, your autopilot may be malfunctioning, but your turn coordinator will still keep going as long as that flag is still in view. Okay, let's see. What else? I think that's it. So now, thank you for being with me today. I know that it wasn't live, but I really had to uh, had to go through and kind of deal with, with time constraints today because I need to get back over to the other side of town. Uh, so thank you. Don't forget to like the video, share the video with your friends. Um, I'd like to try to get up to 3,000. I'm almost close to a few, maybe less than 50 people short of 3,000. I know it's not a lot, but it still kind of feels good to have people looking at the videos and enjoying the videos. Also, even though this is not live, everybody knows that I answer questions uh, sent to me on the video. So if you have an autopilot question, um, please feel free and I'll answer the questions on the comment sections for the slides. Otherwise, hey, thanks for putting up with me this long and I'll see you in the next video. Until next time, let's keep it safe.